Hello and welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. My name is Samantha Cairo Toby. I work in Book Arts and Special Collections, and we are very pleased to be working with the Letterform Archive tonight. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about our collections. Um, some of them can help you with your own work. We have um, the Robert Grabhorn History of Printing Collection, which has over 9,000 volumes of fine press, history of printing, type specimens, paper making, and book binding. All the things you need for making your own stuff. We also have the Richard Harrison Collection of Calligraphy. There's more than 400 calligraphers in this collection. It also includes some illuminated manuscripts, leaves from the medieval times, as well as modern manuscripts. I just finished cataloging a whole bunch of modern manuscripts. They're really beautiful. Um, and we also have the George M. Fox Collection of children's books. So that's kind of like the history of Printing from the children's books perspective, um, a lot of color printing, black and white, um, toy and movable books, um, both American and British printers. So thank you very much for coming tonight. I will turn this over to the Letter Form Archive and they can introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, I'm Rob Saunders, the executive director and curator of the Letter From Archive. Um, how do I advance the slides? I assume just this, yes, good. Um, I don't usually do this, Grendel is, is uh, under the weather, so she couldn't do it tonight. Um, so, if you don't know about Type West, so Type West class, raise your hands or alumni, come on, like all the Type West people, okay. So we have a year-long postgraduate certificate program in type design called Type West, and there's a local cohort that's in a classroom here with the collection, and there's a, um, an online cohort that's worldwide. Um, so that's one thing to know, in case you didn't. Uh, we have a reception coming up with the artist for um, the, the exhibit that just opened at the at the archive uh, of Amos Kennedy's work, which is fabulous. And I have a proof copy of his book um, with me on the back uh, table. We also have all of our other books to look at and, and to buy. You can't buy that one though. Um, this is coming up in August. Um, I don't know any more than what the slide says. <laughs> but most of you probably know who Paul Shaw is. Um, a workshop in September with Angie Wang and where to go to find out more and how to become a member. Um, and also do follow us on Instagram, it's fun. Um, so thank you so much to the San Francisco Public Library for hosting us here. We've been collaborating on these lectures for almost 10 years now, like 2016, I think. So coming on to, uh, nine years now, and um, through the pandemic when we didn't do it, but we're still co-sponsoring, and uh, it's, it's really nice to be back for the occasional in-person one, uh, and we hope to be doing more of them. Um, so, but there's still an active uh, program of them, um, of virtual lectures online, um, which you can see on either website. Um, so tonight our speaker is Tim Ripper, who's a type designer at Commercial Type in New York. Um, and um, uh, he's been involved with the um, Commercial Classics program, which is reviving mostly 19th century stuff. And, um, and is also now kind of merging into uh, commercial type. So I think there's also a deeper story. Um, but he's a wonderful designer and commercial, as you may know, is, well actually I was gonna say this is your font, but it's not. It's not. It's not. Usually these are in duplicate. Our, our house font is duplicate, which is a commercial font. And it's what's on our website and it's what's usually on these. But anyway, I'll just kind of move on past that. And please welcome Tim. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. 
Um, well, thanks for all coming tonight um, and hearing me talk about something that's uh, been a really fascinating project for me and I've been deeply involved with. Um, and there's few periods in type history where something happens that totally upends convention and changes how things look in an unprecedented way. And this is, this is really the story about such an era, how it inspired one of the most complex and largest projects that we've ever done at commercial type, um, and how it relates to our current era and ties the past to the future. Um, whoops, let's go forward. Um, so this project is called Commercial Classics. And what this is, is instead of reviving a few particular styles of type, what we've really tried to do is recreate an entire library of um, 19th century English typefaces that have been reinterpreted for designers today. And so currently there's about 20 different families uh, in this library. Um, but this is sort of an underrepresentation because a lot of these are in fact families themselves with dozens of different styles. So, um, so this has really been a massive project that uh, we launched in 2019, but the story, it's, it's really taken 30 years basically. Um, uh, from the start of the earliest typefaces in this to, to today, um, and basically grown to involve pretty much everyone on our staff in completing it. Um, <clears throat> but the, the story really starts, as I said, more than 30 years ago, um, and it's with my colleague Paul Barnes, who lives in London um, and is one of the partners of Commercial Type. Um, and so over the years, Paul has built a relationship with the St. Bride Foundation, which is an incredible uh, archive of graphic arts and type specimens and all sorts of printing ephemera. Um, and so at Commercial, pretty much every project that we do ultimately starts with examining historical sources. And so places like St. Bride or the Letterform Archive or the Balin Center in New York are, are really essential to our work and what we do as type designers. Um, and so Paul had been working on a set of revivals of, of typefaces whose, whose sources and specimens are in St. Bride's collection. And so he, um, once he began working with Christian, the other partner in commercial type, decided that um, it would be a great project to build, expand this collection of revivals, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and to not just bring them to graphic designers today, but to um, use these to, to raise awareness about this, this particular period in history, raise awareness of St. Bride, and also whose proceeds would go to benefit um, St. Bride itself. So why 19th century and why, why particularly 19th century England? Why did we focus on this particular era? Um, and to build a little case for you about why um, we focused on this, I'm gonna run through quickly 100 years of design history. Um, and what we're going to do is look at this in playbills from um, theaters in England, uh, starting around 1760. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm doing this not to, to cherry pick a particular source, because the patterns that we're going to see, you can actually pick up in all sorts of graphic design. Um, but playbills are a good source because they're easily accessible. You can go to the British Library and search for them. Um, there's tons of, tons of examples and they, they're very like graphically emphatic. And so you can easily see, um, when trends change. Um, so at the beginning of the 1760s, playbills look sort of like this. Um, there's essentially one weight of type. Um, there's some hierarchy, uh, 
that's obtained with letter spacing and size and some use of italics. Um, but things are basically center aligned. Um, and continuing up through the 1780s and 1790s, this is pretty much the, the paradigm, the example that uh, they follow. Um, and this is all over, all over England. Any, um, every place is kind of doing the same thing. Um, getting into around the turn of the 19th century, um, you can start to see uh, some variation in size and a little bit more complex layouts, um, but essentially the same thing. Um, and it's not until you get into the 1810s and 1820s that something really interesting starts to happen, which is that type gets bolder. And going into the mid 1820s, um, you start to see really bold faces totally take over graphic design. Um, and you see types like the, or type styles like the, sand, um, the slab serif and the fat face and the sand serif, which had never existed before in type, um, start to become totally ubiquitous in graphic design. Um, and people start making ornamented variations of them um, and this is really the paradigm that uh, this follows from here on out. Um, and with type being as kind of as bold as possible to pick out those, those titles and then also getting, getting squished and more condensed to really fit as, fill as much of the space as possible. Um, and so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how how those types were developed. Um, and it's, it's possible to see that coming from a modern face like this, um, to get something bolder, it was, you know, you could add more weight and put more ink on the page by increasing the weight of the vertical stems. Um, but then once this was done, it's sort of a logical conclusion that then you can go in the vertical direction too. Um, and increase or decrease the contrast um, to create what's known as a slab serif or Egyptian or sometimes antique. And this was really kind of a, concept, um, a con conceptual breakthrough um, because then that opened the floodgates to doing all kinds of different operations to type. Like you could cut the serifs off to make a sand serif. And indeed, this is sort of how the first sands were developed. Um, or you could take the weight out of the vertical stems and make these weird reverse contrast things called talions. Um, and so what this is really about, or, or why this era is so interesting, is not just because of all the new type styles that were developed, but because it's really um, a new way of thinking about type. Um, as this kind of skeleton of a letter form that you can, uh, has weight applied to it that you can move around to create new type styles. Um, and also that <clears throat> it, was, it was easier then to think of new type styles as derivative of old ones, that you could apply a sort of operation to an existing type and then easily get something new that wasn't there before. Um, so why did this happen? Uh, well, in the late 18th century, um, there was something in, the Engl in England called the Industrial Revolution. Um, and this was really kind of a conceptual shift as well, um, that um, all of a sudden, um, new ways of thinking allowed new technological developments and also a sort of new way of um, thinking of craft as something that could be rationalized and mechanized. Um, so people working, working in factories, and this really um, kind of touched every nook and cranny of, of people's lives and upended um, society and culture in every way imaginable. Um, and one of the implications of this is printing. So um, 
printing presses themselves were subject to technological developments that made them print faster since they could be made from iron and steel instead of wood. Um, the paper making process was also mechanized and paper started to be made from wood pulp instead of cotton rag. So you had this kind of uh, abundant cheap supply of printing substrate and fast printing. Um, and so uh, this was it created an explosion of uh, printed advertising. Um, and this too couldn't have really existed without um, the economic conditions of the Industrial Revolution where there were there was a new urban middle class who had a lot of disposable income and they could spend it on luxury goods, they could spend it on travel or tickets to see the theater or the opera and, um, and could be advertised to. And you can see in, in scenes like this where there's sort of a visual cacophony of, of all these different ads um, and playbills and um, <clears throat> that basically the bolder your type was and the larger it is, the more it's go it could stand out. Um, and printers recognized this and type founders recognized this and really rose to the challenge of creating all of these new styles of, of type. And that's, those are what I really consider to be the driving forces of that um, pattern that I showed you uh, earlier. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanna do in a, in a little bit is talk in depth about some of the process of how we made um, some of the faces in, commer in commercial classics um, and particular ones that I was deeply involved in myself. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to, to give sort of um, an, an overview of our approach and our philosophy with the project. And I think to, to start off, um, we knew that we wanted to include all kind of the major type styles that were emblematic of this period or that first came to be in this period, um, such as the modern face, um, the fat face, the sans serif, and the Egyptian or slab serif. Um, and I think we also wanted to kind of ch go back to the source, really, like cho choose examples of these that, um, that really showed the vitality of something new being developed. And that's what I think um, the commercial classics is about in a way that, you know, these are genres like the sands and the, and the slab and modern that are still being developed today. But what, you know, a current slab serif is, is very different from an early 19th century English slab serif. Um, and, our, our approach is also about um, reinterpretation rather than strict revival. Um, not that we wanted to create very faithful replicas of these old types to kind of, you know, li live in a room and collect dust together, but to create something that was um, really revised and expanded often for to, to make them usable for designers today. And I'll talk a little bit later about what those implications are. Um, and so in revising and expanding stuff um, from the past, I think there's always an, an aspect of anachronism and speculative fiction. And I wanted to show this, uh, this image, which I really love of, from a, a scene at the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I, something, something about this, this image has always captivated me and I think it has something to do with exactly how that anachronism works, that um, there's something grounding about history which then when it comes together with something futuristic um, becomes really transcendent. And I would argue too that in order for this to work the way it does that the historical aspect of it has to be convincing. You have to be convinced that um, this is from a particular era of, hi of history to be really grounded and then allow the confrontation of the future to, to happen and make something new. 
Um, so I think we, we had something like this in mind um, with, with designing these things, the notion of the standard not, not being historical authenticity, but that you're convinced that something, something is, from, is from this era and in a way that um, allows it to be, to be this kind of grounding influence in, in something new. Um, so the per first project I'd like to talk about is Successor. And this was something that um, I was really uh, re responsible for um, from the start. And this is, this is a uh, reinterpretation of a 19th century English Egyptian. And um, I wanted to talk about it uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it, um, I think it exemplifies some of our process of how we, how it's not a revival of a specific style, but actually a reinterpretation of an entire genre. Um, and it's also, um, it's also something that's more of a, of a workhorse typeface um, that later, later on I'll show some, some other projects I've done that are um, much more of a particular historical time. Um, but um, this is, was, was intended to, to be sort of um, more, more usable in a way. Um, and so what I mean by a 19th century English Egyptian um, is actually a little tricky to nail down. And um, so in, in talking about this, I'm, I'll try to make a little bit of an explanation for that. Um, but in general, it's, it, it, it's something that is a slab serif. It has overall low contrast. Um, but beyond that, the real challenge of this project was in sort of figuring out for myself what that means and how to make it look um, convincing, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so the way this project really started was uh, my colleague Paul gave me this huge um, collection of images. And these are all basically like photos of every possible specimen he could find at St. Bride, which had an Egyptian face in it. So the first phase of the project was just kind of sitting with these and... Um, in a way, it's a little analogous to language immersion. Like before you start to speak a language, like you need to have enough of a, be, be sort of immersed in the environment of it. And, um, and that's, that's really what was, what was going on here. Organizing these, um, sitting with them, and starting to kind of pick out ones that I liked or felt were less successful in a way. Um, and so I think the, the image at the, the top left here um, from the Figgins Foundry is really a fantastic example of what a 19th century English Egyptian um, should be. There's something authoritative and clean about it um, that I think has something to do with um, the, the particular weight and proportion and evenness in that, in that rhythm. Um, Whereas I think the the Kazan example at the at the upper right is a little bit less successful. Um, there's a little bit more kind of chaos in the proportions of the letters, how the weight is distributed. Um, I don't know if the if the ball terminals help it. And then I think at the bottom, the example from uh, from Fry's foundry is kind of kind of a case for what we didn't want. Um, that uh, <clears throat> each letter sort of looks like it's been drawn separately without really consideration for the overall appearance of the typeface. Um, so while these things are really interesting to us as type designers, as an artifact, um, I knew this was not going to be a model for a successor. Um, and <clears throat> I think that, that points out something as well, that I think with commercial classics, we took... Um, we could take a more critical eye towards history. Like there's plenty of these things which um, were successful in their day, but simply don't work now, or they might've been historical missteps in a sense. Um, but it's great that they're preserved. Um, 
And so, so next, I, I was sort of um, began to break this down by looking at key letters. And I think there's certain, um, certain glyphs in typefaces that really carry a lot of the work in making them look the way they do. And for Egyptians, um, that's often things like the cap R and the A, um, S, and so forth. Um, and so I was looking at the kind of the space of variation here um, and really kind of getting into, into details about, um, you know, whether the angle of the terminals, uh, how, that, how that affects things, um, you know, did we want ball terminals or flat terminals? Um, how the, you know, how thin is that center bar in the E? How, how does the spine in the S work? Um, so really sort of nitty gritty things. Um, and eventually I, I was beginning to like actually start drawing these. And from here it was pretty easy to, to see kind of immediately what sorts of things would work and what sort of things wouldn't and what felt convincing to us and, and what didn't. Um, and in, in sort of drawing different versions of this, I talked about there being kind of a common structure of all of these uh, before. And the, looking at different variations of this really highlighted that, that there's beyond choices about what terminals you have in your typeface or you know, what certain details are um, about how something is drawn. There's an overall distribution of weight and certain parameters that make these things feel different. Um, and so, what I mean by this is there, there are certain things like how weight is distributed um, on the vertical extremes of the letters um, or what the proportion is of counterforms to the stems, how long the, um, the serifs are in relationship to the, to the overall width of the letter. Um, what these what these gaps are between the serifs um, and how wide they are, um, how how deep the notches are on letters like the the U and the N, um, and so this this was really crucial as I said about to both expand the rest of the character set and also fill out the rest of the styles in this typeface um, and. Uh, to talk a little bit about that, um, what this chart is showing is sort of a space of the width, sort of the width, um, of overall width of the type, and then the overall weight of, of the type. Um, and where, where in this design space you can find examples of these in historical specimens. Um, and the left is Roman and the right is Italic. And it's in the Roman, they, you can find examples of a, sort of a lot of these different um, combinations of width and weight, um, but there, there's still always parts of it that were never filled out. Like the kind of the, the very boldest and very narrowest and also um, towards the very lightest end of the, of the weight range, um, you just don't see a lot of references for this, and particularly in the Italic. People were really only drawing Italic Egyptians. It's sort of like a um, regular to, to bold weight. Um, so, so there's really a lot of speculative fiction, as I, as I was talking about in doing this, that um, making this project creates something that's extremely ahistorical, but that we really need in order for it to be usable by graphic designers today who might expect a family of type to have a full range of weights plus italics or a full range of widths, for example. Um, so this, uh, uh, the normal width of Successor was um, released in last year and I'm still in process of figuring um, or expanding the, the different widths of this. Um, but what, one thing I wanted to, um, to discuss a little bit, uh, next is, um, is, is actually a, like a very key part of this is, and is how these things are used. Um, 
since uh, that's always kind of our been our aim with this project to liberate these sources in a sense from history and allow them to be placed in a new context. And I think particularly with uh, faces like Egyptians, um, they tend to fall into certain sorts of predictable patterns of design, um, like, uh, um, and so I think when I went into doing this project, I was, I was expecting in a way that the most popular styles of successor would be the ones that were boldest, since that's kind of really the key of what this is about or what people might associate Egyptians with. And, um, and actually it's been, it's been sort of the opposite, which is the fascinating thing, um, that uh, many of the examples that people, that designers have used have been for text weights and lighter weights um, and uh, not these sort of very emphatic things, but actually more subtle designs, like for an art gallery website. Um, and my friend Matthew used this for his own design practice website. This is the, the extra light, which I think looks, looks great here. Um, and then um, also that it could be in a totally different context, like an academic research lab for uh, neuroscience. Um, so this is always really cool for, for us as type designers to see kind of that there's no way to, um, to really expect a lot of times how you're how your typefaces will be used. Um, <clears throat> so the, the next project I want to talk about is, is kind of, in a way, a counterexample to Successor. So while Successor is a, re a reinterpretation of an entire genre of type, um, this is a revival of a particular style. And in contrast to being a workhorse type, this is really a, a typeface that's very much of its time. Um, but ornamented faces have always been um, uh, ex exemplify what Victorian graphic design or 19th century graphic design is, is about. Like in this um, painting of all the posters, um, in addition to the kind of the, the more um, standard styles of type, you also see these outline faces and shadow faces. And so we knew from the beginning with commercial classics that we wanted to include ornamented faces in the library, but I think we were, um, we, knew, we were a little, had a little trepidation about um, putting in something that was too ornamental. And so um, we, we chose kind of some of the more austere options like these. Um, <clears throat> but I, I myself really gravitated towards these more um, ornate variations um, like this, the one at the bottom here. Um, and I knew kind of immediately once I saw this that I wanted to try making a revival of it. And, um, and the, the other point I wanna make here is that, uh, is sort of, is sort of how, the, how these ornamental faces were made a lot of times is as derivative forms of existing typefaces. Um, so, if you look carefully, the, the rounded face at the top is really the structure for the ornamented face at the bottom. That this was already drawn or actually probably existed as just a solid form. And then someone came in and put the shadow in and then it was a new style. And then they called in someone else who drew all the rosettes and uh, little leaves and stuff. And then, then that was a new style. Um, and <clears throat> so, Actually, what had happened at this point is that Paul and Christian and I had already done a revival of the rounded face at the top. And so this was really kind of a perfect use case to see how this might work in the digital realm um, in addition to the, or instead of the metal type realm. Um, and <clears throat> one of the problems we had was in finding sufficient references for this, since it's not, it's something that only appears from time to time in, in playbills. Um, and in the specimens, they don't show a very full character set at all since it's a fairly large um, typeface. And so fortunately, this was uh, St. Bride to the rescue. They actually have the original punches 
of this face um, in their collection. And so Paul went and took photos and I could use, use that as the reference. Um, and this is really incredible to see if you haven't actually uh, examined punches in real life, but this is, the, fa the face is so big that the, it's like a box that weighs 50 pounds or something. So it's a very physical experience interacting with this uh, material. Um, but then uh, a lot of, the, making this digitally was actually not as, as difficult as expected since we can kind of, um, there are forms that are reused frequently throughout the, the character set, um, like these, these rosettes or ears. And so we could make com components of those in RoboFont and then kind of apply them um, and with some redrawing of the band that's within the letter. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, making the, digi the digitization of this worthwhile, um, kind of from the, from the get go, we also knew that we wanted to be able to split this into, uh, colored layers, um, to create different effects, um, and, and sort of Give, in a way, give a justification for this being um, a, a, a digital version. And so you can create all kinds of uh, very psychedelic things with this. Um, uh, or uh, Matthew Smith, who's, um, sorry, whose website I showed you earlier, also used this for, as a rollover effect. Um, and I thought that was kind of a, a great example for, um, sorry, I'm having mic problems. Okay. Um, for, have, for having this in digital realm um, and, and being really interactive. And it's also been satisfying too to see St. Bride themselves um, or uh, Becky Chilcott, who I think does the graphic design for St. Bride to use this in promotional material for, uh, for their organization. Um, <clears throat> so the last project I wanted to discuss isn't, uh, isn't part of the classics collection per se, um, but I really wanted to talk about it tonight because, um, well, for one, it's, it's um, basically a reinterpretation of a lettering source instead of a uh, typographic source. And second, because this is something that I really only did through um, encountering this at the Letterform Archive. So this is a project that would not have happened without, um, without being here. And so what, what Seance is, is it, it's a revival of an alphabet um, from this uh, specimen, a lettering specimen by a French uh, calligrapher and artist named Jean Midol. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually a couple of sheets of this, I think are here tonight um, uh, that you can examine after the, after the talk. Um, but it's a portfolio of loose sheets uh, that are color lithographed and have all these crazy alphabets on them. And in particular, I was drawn to um, two black letter styles that, <clears throat> um, just were, were unlike anything that, I, that I'd seen before really, or sort of defied categorization about what a black letter could be since they're um, kind of calligraphic in completely different ways from how you would expect. And they have all these amazing flourishes and the, and the printed object too is fantastic because of the, um, the colored backgrounds on a lot of the plates. Um, but I knew as soon as I saw this that I, I was curious to see, I ha, like I had to see if it would work as a typeface outside of the context of lettering. Um, and so sort of the first step in that was kind of determining how much work the, the context was doing because that's kind of the key distinction in working from lettering sources uh, versus typographic sources that these are this really, um, the fact that it's in an alphabet does a lot of the work um, of reading the letters for you. Um, and not only that, but 
I suspected that the, all the flourishes around the letters would also do some of the work in um, making these look impressive. So <clears throat> I, I kind of went and took out those um, and yeah, these are, these are still like really, really interesting forms. Um, and in this other, other particular source, um, I think taking out the flourishing here, it starts to become clear that um, there, there are some issues with this, that uh, not, a, not only is it um, it's sort of like with the example of the Egyptian I showed earlier, that every letter is kind of drawn to a different, a different model, um, but also that some of them are totally uh, unreadable as letters. So like you can pick out a B or a C up here, um, but you might not guess what the other ones are supposed to be. Um, and so this, this then really became a dialogue between myself and the, and the original source instead of a revival because I knew if I wanted to make this as a typeface, it had to be usable outside of just typing the alphabet. And so I wanted the letters to, to have more, more readability. So a lot of this was looking at the, the forms of the letters and really trying to like do some method acting and go inside of these and, and try to, to figure out how they might have been drawn in different variations. Um, so this was refining what the W is in the form that I ended up with at the, at the right. Um, and there's always challenges too in expanding the character set of these because um, this was literally just an alphabet. So I sort of tried to use the calligraphic logic of this to make punctuation or for figures, um, utilize bits and pieces of the existing forms and kind of cobble them together to, to make something, again, that felt convincing to me. Um, as much as I possibly could, because again, a lot of this is ahistorical. Um, so this this ended up as these two different uh, styles, and I called them seance because of this kind of dialogue that was that was happening with a with a someone who was who was dead, um, and it's also this the spookiness of the of the black letter. Um, but I was in addition to just kind of seeing how these would end up and if they were usable as type, I was, I was super curious how they would be used by graphic designers or would anyone even want to, to use these. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, um, I, I really had no ex expectations of how this would turn out. And what we did is uh, release this through what we call the vault on our website. So we have kind of a section of incomplete or not totally finished typefaces that are kind of, um, uh, because people are always asking us if we have unreleased projects that could be usable. And so now we can point them to a page where they can actually license those. Um, and <clears throat> this has been really, really interesting to see play out in different situations like this um, poster that Fraser's studio has done my friend Johnny used these as uh, on T-shirts for his soccer team, um, and it's also a Document Journal, which is a fashion magazine, um, used it for uh, title pages and um, chapter spreads throughout their their magazine. And I thought this was really um, a, a fantastic use of of something that's so ornamental and um, evanescent. Uh, in, in the same way that fashion can be. Um, and <clears throat> so in, before I wrap up, um, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of my, my own um, personal relationship to a lot of these projects beyond how I've worked on them. Um, and also a little bit about kind of a larger meaning um, to commercial classics, uh, since um, you know we put we put an awful lot of of time and effort and money into into doing this, and I, I sort of I think we feel like it should have a bit of a larger purpose um, beyond just selling fonts, and um, in 
I guess one thing that I'm personally drawn to is the sort of personal encounters that you, or direct encounters that you can have in working with historical materials and historical artifacts. And to, to explain a little bit what I mean by that, um, this, is, this is a picture of one of my favorite places in Oakland. Um, and this is actually a columbarium. So it's a repository for uh, people's ashes. And the fascinating thing is the, the urns are all in the shape of books. So you have this weird experience of walking through here being surrounded by people's lives, essentially. And that's, I mean, the, it can be really sad, too, because you can't take the books down and open them up and read those stories. Um, but, and I, th I think there's also something poignant about working with historical sources a lot of times that... Um, you know, you have this connection, a human connection over time with uh, people who, who are no longer with us. Um, but in archives, the nice thing is that you can actually take the books down and open them up and find those stories uh, and remember them and bring them to other people. Um, and and so the, I think the, there's a tendency in history for the, for the, um, to kind of work in cycles like that of loss and remembrance um, and loss and remembrance. And there's something there in, um, I think that's important to, uh, to think about as, as designers um, in, in terms of our relationship to that. And... Um, <clears throat> I guess to, to, to talk about that a little bit, um, there's a really great uh, quote um, that is actually um, on the, the posters that we have here tonight. Um, so uh, Ben has designed um, posters for this talk and uh, Ben Shaken, and um, you should uh, grab one on the way out if you haven't already. But um, the, the quote that I'm talking about comes from um, this film, Space is the Place, which stars the avant-garde jazz musician Sun Ra. And in the film, he is assembling this crew of people in Oakland to travel to the planet Jupiter and create this kind of utopian settlement um, uh, free from the history of racial injustice. And so... In this scene, he is explaining to this alien or whatever how he is going to do that. And he says, we need to consider time as officially ended. We work on the other side of time. And I can't claim to totally unpack everything that, that Sun Ra um, is, is saying here, but I think it has something to do with this, that there, in these cycles of history, there can be a tendency to... Um, to get stuck in, in eddies where we're sort of rehashing the past. Um, and, but I think if, if we're able to find something that's really timeless and take that out of, of a time context, that then there's a way to work productively with these cycles and have agency in, um, in making something that's, that's actually new. Um, and I think that's, that's really at the heart of what our work is about at, um, like with commercial classics and also with our other projects at commercial, which often start out with these historical sources, um, that <clears throat> our work is really about, um, these things from the past happening to new designers. It's the past inside the future. Um, and I'm showing this billboard not, um, not just because of that, that sentiment, um, but because I think it has, uh, but this is in LA, and I think I wanted to talk specifically about um, California too. And I think California is a, is a place that in a way I feel is almost an ideal home for a project like commercial classics because there is there's something very um, I feel like it has a, a, a longer leash on history than say New York or London and it's really a place that that's that's frequently a ground zero for changes that 
end up sweeping the rest of the country or even the world. Um, and, and, and new possibilities. And I think new, new possibilities and new opportunities is, is ultimately what this, this project is about. Um, that the types that I showed you from the era of the Industrial Revolution, um, I think are, are great because you can really, they're from a period of incredible change and incredible upheaval. And I think you can see that vitality um, in the design of the types. And you can see those designers responding to those new challenges and really making something new from those opportunities. And, um, and so I think in, in our own era, which uh, you know, is also experiencing great changes and um, in, at sort of an ever accelerating pace, um, I think that's, that's important. Um, for a thing that we we consider a lot um, it, with a, with projects like these, that um, in in looking at these challenges, that we also find uh, new opportunities, um, and for in reconstructing the past in productive ways that we can, in our own sort of small way as designers, uh, be able to shape our future. So I'd like to thank you again for, for coming tonight. Um, um, for, <clears throat> sorry, for, um, yeah, for spending time uh, hearing something that I'm, is very personal to me. And I'd like to thank the library and the Letter Form Archive for having me. Um, I'd like to thank my, my colleagues, Paul and Christian, for supporting this work. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ben Shaken for designing this incredible poster. So please remember to, to get a copy um, on the way out back there. Um, and also, I'd, I'd like to thank archives and libraries in general, um, like the Letter from Archive and uh, St. Bride, for without which this work would really not have been possible. Thank you so much, Tim, for your wonderful presentation. We're gonna open the floor up for the next 15 minutes or so for any questions that you might have about for Tim. I also have stickers if anyone would like to ask a question. Awesome. <laughs> Hi. Hey, cool. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the business of fonts Meaning, how long is it? Is it a copyrightable thing, and how long can you copyright it for? And are the previous fonts from the <clears throat> previous centuries are they copyrighted? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Um, so as far as I know, um, well, the the old fonts would be public domain, um, but the designs themselves um, are not copyrightable, as far as as I'm aware. Um, I think there's some in the legality of this. I think names are often copyrightable, but the the font data itself is not. Um, so in 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 working from these, I think I think maybe what you're getting to is sort of issues of originality as well, possibly. But um, I think there's. Um, like this is there's always uh, sort of in transition from different forms of uh, of type, there's always sort of um, that's always part of what what type design is about. Um, I think um, it wasn't a loaded question or yeah. anything. I was just curious about mm. like how does someone can be brilliant enough to make money from doing this and and uh, make this an art form and all that. I was mm. just curious. Okay. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, uh, thanks for the, the scene from Space Odyssey because I think my interpretation of that scene uh, is very different. It's I see it as um, maybe aliens trying to put together something that they think humans mm. uh, would have their better of like. So I think while reinterpreting these typefaces, how do you uh, avoid being the alien trying to think this is what they were thinking and trying to connect it to your process of what you want it to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is, 
Right. There's always, um, yeah, there's always, there's always an inherent bias in, in doing these and sort of our own, um, uh, we're, we're bringing our own ways of thinking into the, into the past. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's just something that I need to accept as part of the process and we need to accept as part of the process that, um, the the point isn't you know the the historical accuracy, but making it believable to us or to to graphic designers and um, uh, but yeah, I guess it it can feel feel a little bit alien sometimes how how you connect across such a length of time um, to the to these original sources. Thank you. Hi, are you planning to do ornamentations as well, like not to? To or just typefaces. I mean, oh, the ornaments that like that uh, came with the old type. Um, oh, like um, like purely ornamented characters, not letters. Not only the, not only the characters, but like you know, the the, all the the you used to have like you know, this the the lines, the the, mm. the decorations, the decorative you know, elements that would come with the typeface. Right. Uh, yeah. So far, that hasn't been. That hasn't been part of what we've released, um, and I'm not sure if it, if we plan to either. Thank you. Okay. Um, what has been the most frustrating part of the process? Uh, I think the most frustrating part is um, is being stuck, which happens uh, quite often in in trying to figure out what how to make things look the way that I want them to look. Um, so the successor project, um, I mean, that, that took many years, really. That was like a five-year project because I would start drawing something and then get to a point where it clearly wasn't working, but I also didn't know why it wasn't working. And so then I sort of had to put it down and you know, not, not think about it for a while and then come back to it. Um, but that that happens all the time throughout the type design process. I think it's sort of also the nature of it. Oh. Um, are there other areas of history that commercial classes is looking into? Or, or if is is there one that you would hypothetically be interested in exploring other than nineteenth um, century England? I guess that's been that's been the 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 main focus of it so far, just because we've already amassed so many typefaces that are fall within that category. Um, but I guess I guess for if I was to add something from another another era or another um, another place, then it might no longer be commercial classics technically. But I guess I I see it as more of an expanded sense that anything kind of from this from this era um, of, of new developments um, that could could inform our, our present could could fall under the, that umbrella, but. Um, as far as I know, we won't, it, it, it's just 19th century England. Hi, so um, I'm in the Type West program and we just finished a term where we all made revivals. And one big aspect of making a revival I just found is that we had to struggle with how faithful we wanted it to be to the original versus how approachable we wanted it to be to modernize. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you find any glyphs that it sort of broke your heart to leave behind because they looked too weird in a modern context? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the, I think that was part of the the seance project that there's something there's something so great about the original form of it and the notion that of letters that don't aren't readable as letters, but that I felt. To make to make it usable for for myself, I needed to 
be divorced a little bit from the original sources. Um, but yeah, I think that's 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 pretty common thing in, in doing these. Um, so um, your project is mostly based on English type, and I was just wondering, is there consideration on with modern usage of typefaces, accessibility, and how certain rules might apply to characters that are associated with foreign languages, uh, such as accented letters or, um, say, French characters? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the. I guess the... I guess I can't speak to like visual accessibility that much, um, but in terms of of um, like having a character set that supports different languages, um, all of all of these typefaces pretty much do. So they have um, a, a full character set of of accented glyphs um, for for setting I don't know hundreds hundreds of different languages. So. Um, so the the exceptions to that really are um, the uh, are really seance, I guess, because that is is unfinished. I didn't do accented glyphs for that, um, but these re the rest of them have our standard character set. I was curious, how did you get into uh, what was the inspiration for going into this business? Into this business, yeah. Uh, how, how, what inspired you to go into typesetting? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess, ultimately, it has to do with um, my my dad was a graphic designer, and so when I was a kid, I would go into his office and mess around with Quark Express or whatever it was at the time, and um, so I knew I knew what fonts were at some early stage, but it's um, it, it's sort of a circuitous route. Like I've always been interested in a lot of different things, and so I tried a lot of different um, academic interests and and jobs before I ultimately settled on this. But I think, um, I guess I would say it, it, it it's interesting to me and fulfilling because type design can incorporate so many different things. Like you can be. Um, you can draw and you can be a technical per sort of person or a programmer or um, a researcher and writer. Like there's all different parts of the space that uh, that you can investigate if you if you so desire. So um, yeah, I think it's it's kind of a nice synthesis of different things I'm interested in. Hi. Um, some typefaces evoke a sense of emotion. Did, did you think successor kind of evoked a particular emotion in its historical context? Um, well, I think uh, it evokes a lot of emotions. I think that's, that's what's interesting about type, that there's not, a, and, and design in general, that form isn't pinned down to a specific thing. Like I think there, um, and it can also vary across the different styles in the family. Like it could be authoritative or it could be solid or um, forceful, but it could also in the lighter weights be more more delicate or um, graceful. Like I think there's, um, yeah, I think that that range of, of different emotions taken together is what gives them the different possibilities. Uh Hi, so since I'm so young, I know maybe like one other person who's interested in typography. And um, so how do you get the average person like interested in or excited in like what you do and typography in general, since it's kind of like a niche um, field of design? Like the average, the average person who might be interested in type or? Or like the... Like average person you'd see on the street who maybe like doesn't really know what typography is, like not even the word. Um, I mean, I guess I guess I can't make someone interested in something if they're not going to be interested. But I guess I guess the case I would make is something like this: that um, 
you know, t type is something that you're, you're constantly interacting with. And from the minute that you wake up in the morning to like the last time you check your phone at night or whatever. So um, it's, if you start to look at type with, um, and, and start to learn about, about how it works, I think that can, that can be a really fascinating experience um, to, to kind of see how, um, you know, di different, different layer forms. And, sorry, the uh, mic cut out again. Um, yeah, to kind of, kind of see how um, different, different sorts of letter forms and styles make, make people feel different ways and, um, you know, really, really work, so. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, how can we eliminate the limitations that comes with the medium type face is displayed at? And I can actually connect this question to the previous one um, because we looked at a lot of prints, posters, um, but right now um, the most accessible and popular medium we see typefaces on is digital monitors. Um, and I feel like that is also um, partially the reason why typography and typeface design is becoming a niche um, because mostly product designers and UX designers, they usually would just care about the commercial use, contrast, pixel size, accessibility guidelines, but do not actually get into the details of typography design. Um, and I'm also working in that area and I'd like to get some um, advice on how to make typography um, more, um, how to make myself understand typography in more depth and not just use it as something that would add commercial value to the product I'm working on. Wait, there were there are a few different parts to that question. Just, what was what was the okay. first one? Um, the first one about was media, right? Medium. Um, you can just talk about how do you see digital mediums and typography designs interaction. Um, how do you view it, or um, if if you, if you see any um, risks associated with it, or if you see any opportunities? Um, because right now. Um, does really feel like typography design is becoming more niche or um, almost like an elite um, interest, um, not available to the general public. Um, and so like opp yeah. opportunities for how how a person might might get into doing it, or like a, a person might have agency over it, or and not really agency. Um, you can just focus on um, how we can be more mindful on displaying typography in digital products, in digital mediums, and still make it um, publicly available and make public grasp more than just the shallow, just the, the surface of typography. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I guess one, th one thing I would say is that, um, an, an interesting thing about a lot of these designs is that they're they're surprisingly medium agnostic. Like in terms of things like readability, the things that type founders would have done in the past to make something more readable on paper is pretty similar to how you might compensate a font for small sizes digitally. So, um, but then on the other hand, there's there's things that you can do with digital type forms that you could never do with. Um, when they're in metal, like the examples I showed of having colored layers that you can animate or have roller effects and things like that. So, um, so I mean, there's always, we're always on the lookout for sort of new technical possibilities um, for our, our type and for graphic designers who are using them in, in interesting ways digitally, um, but also, also in print too. Um, like I don't think our, aside from the fact that we make the type on the computer, I don't think we 
we don't typically go in with a, a goal in mind that like this is only going to be a screen font or this is only going to be printed. Um, I think there's the the digital flexibility allows a lot of different eventualities. Um, I'll have I'll take one more question I think or. Uh... Thanks for the presentation. I'm curious, what's your favorite way you've seen your font used out in the wild? The favorite favorite example? Yeah. I mean, all the, yeah, I think uh, it's hard to choose among the ones that that I've shown, which I think are all, I, I, I really loved when I, when I saw those. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's always, it's always exciting. It's sort of, of like a rush that never never goes away whenever you spot something that you've that you've made um so yeah it's nice to uh to, yeah to have have people who, who use your fonts and do things that you don't expect great <clears throat> thank you so much um to everyone who asked questions and thank you to tim for the wonderful presentation and thank you to the sf public library for hosting us today um, feel free to check out our website, letterformarchive.org, for more info about events and other goings on. But yeah, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.